It is my pleasure and privilege to be in conversation with Sunita Kohli tonight. Sunita needs little introduction, uh, she, but I'll do the needful all the same. Sunita is a research-based interior designer and architectural conservationist and the finest furniture manufacturer in all styles, from the classical to the contemporary. She was conferred the first and only Padma Shri in the field of interior design and architectural con conservation in 1992. Over the course of a celebrated career spanning close to 50 years, Sunita has restored some of the most iconic heritage buildings in New Delhi, including the Rashtrapati Bhavan. <clears throat> she is the foremost research authority on the work of Sir Edwin Lutyens in all of India. Her design repertoire consists of luxury hotels, hotel boats on the River Nile, forts, palaces, museums, libraries, and select private res residences, both within and outside India. She has served also in recent years as the chairperson of the School of Planning and Architecture in Bhopal, which is a national institute of excellence. She has delivered lectures at institutions and universities, such as at the National Buildings Museum in Washington, DC, and the Emory and Harvard universities. She has edited and written essays for several journals, books, and publications, and has been the chief curator of a prestigious design exhibition that uh, happened in September of this year. And apart from all this, she's also the author of a best-selling cookbook, which she has co-authored with her mother, Chansfur, last year. I'll give context to the conversation tonight. Uh, our conversation tonight will be interspersed with illustrative PowerPoint presentations, which Sunita will use to walk us through the meaning of Ganga Jabni Tehzeeb, its world, and its intangible and tangible expression in cuisine, architecture, and design. She will also walk us through the cultural influences that have shaped her design philosophy and work. We begin with a journey back to her roots through the Lucknow cookbook, which is already in its fifth imprint and is somewhat more than a mere compilation of recipes. And I'd like to quote S. Prasanna Rajan, editor of Open Magazine, from his fantastic review. I quote, the Lucknow cookbook is a cultural testament by one of India's most accomplished aesthetes. Every recipe in this book tells a story that is more than culinary. It takes us to the private kitchen of our heritage, lest we forget the range and richness of the taste of the subcontinent. Marinated in ancestral memories, the Lucknow cookbook draws its ingredients from the cultural history of a different time. Never before has tradition been tasteful between Never before has tradition been more tastefully presented. High praise indeed, Sunita. So may I now request you to read a passage from the book. With pleasure and thank you so much for this very, very generous um, introduction. Um, I'll just read uh, two short paragraphs from a note about the book. This is how the book began. And I wrote this and said, Lucknow has always been a city of refinement and its cuisine reflects these sensibilities. In many ways, Lucknow was considered the cultural capital of North India. It was here that the Urdu language was developed to near perfection. It was here too that the Lucknow Gharana of Kathak dance and the Bhatkande Institute of Classical Music, uh, uh, both major institutions were established. Art and architecture, particularly Indo-Saracenic architecture, flourished in the city built along the banks of the river Gomti. Architectural heritage is history written in stone. This is true of the many fine buildings that still exist in this city. Most importantly, Lucknow was and still is a city known for its composite culture, its Ganga uh, Jamani Tehzeeb. The material manifestations of the syncretic culture and refinement, this tehzeeb was symbolized in the combined use of gold, which is represented by the river Ganga, and silver represented by the river Jamuna, uh, such as in silver objects, uh, parts of which were gold washed, or in the use of gold and silver threads 
in Avadi's famous brocades, uh, which were woven in textile centers in Varanasi and in Lucknow. The quintessence of this culture was an amalgamation of the finest of Hindu and Muslim thoughts and their mutual acceptance. This composite culture of plurality and complexity was also reflected in the easy acceptance of the varied cuisines of the various communities that resided in Lucknow. And the, I end this note uh, by saying that David Lowenthal, the American historian renowned for his work on heritage and spatial concepts of the past and the future, had famously pronounced that, and I quote, the past is a foreign country, close quotes. This cookbook, although palpable with nostalgia, and the reason why I said that is because uh, my parents, I was born in Lahore, and after partition came to Lucknow with my parents. Uh, so, so therefore I wrote this cookbook, although palpable with nostalgia, selectively recaptures events and objects from the past that are a part of the intangible heritage of food and familial memories of gentler times. These are collective memories that conserve a sense of continuity, of belonging, and of being rooted. I believe food engenders social and family harmony. It anchors us and connects us to the past, drowns us in the present, and gives us a sense of identity and belonging. Our personal histories define us, and I've chosen to define this partly through Lucknow's food traditions. And uh, then I say that the preparation of food is learned by observation. It is a process of osmosis. In our family, all four generations are reasonably good cooks. This book documents the recipes that we have learned from my mother and from my from our many friends in Lucknow. And one can certainly cook from this book, but one can also read through the recipes to get a glimpse of Lucknowi culture and the lives behind these recipes. This is a book for cooks and for armchair cooks, because for people, <laughs> because for people who really love food, it is a lens through which to view this particular world. And that is the end of this note. Thank you for that eloquent reading, Sunita. Uh, you know, although Lucknow has been a muse to many, and it has inspired great literature, art, music, dance, and um, film, Umrao Jan, Junoon, Garam Hawa, but Lucknow was not home to you in the sense of being rooted there, in rootedness. Your uh, Lucknow story began uh, in a journey of displacement, migration, your parents' journey, uh, which is actually so evocatively des uh, described in your introduction to the book, Vatan Lost and Vatan Found, from Lahore to Lucknow. Could you walk us through your parents' journey and your own Lucknow story? Thank you. Uh, as I said earlier, I was born in Lahore uh, to a Balochi mother. Uh, she comes from Quetta and to a Rajput father. My father's family comes from Jaisalmer, but for four or five generations, they, had, they were naturalized Lahoris. Uh, so when partition happened, really as, as displaced people from undivided India, they could have gone anywhere, but my father chose to go to Lucknow because only once as a college student had he visited Lucknow. And he thought that that, in his memory, it was indelible that that was the only city that he had seen in this part of undivided India that closely approximated the charm and beauty of Lahore and also the manners, the language. My father spoke absolutely exquisite Urdu and exquisite Persian. As did, uh, you know, gentlemen of that era, apart from the fact that he was a devastatingly handsome man. <laughs> he really was. Uh, so I, uh, I came as a child of um, maybe six or seven months, 
and my parents settled down and they lived many, many for a few years in then the best hotel in, um, in Lahore, it, uh, in uh, Lucknow called the Royal Hotel. And it wasn't that they had come with any money, but whatever, uh, whatever my, uh, my mother's jewelry was pawned, and that is what, how they sustained themselves, and my father started a new, uh, another business. And he flourished and he did well. And, and the, I never heard one word of recrimination against why partition happened. And because they were very hospitable people, my mother became a superb cook. They also, I remember wonderful, you know, uh, parties uh, for dinner parties, luncheons, brunches, high teas. And it's very much part of a Lucknow kind of culture because it is an amalgamation of so many different communities. Uh, all, of course, uh, the elite of the city had always been Muslim, but it had wonderful Brahmin families, Kais, Parsis, Bengalis, and all of it, all of them added to the rich heritage, intangible heritage of cuisine in that city. Uh, I'm a practicing Hindu, I grew up in a Muslim city and I studied in a Roman Catholic convent. <laughs> and I think that is what, I, yes. And I think that is what has informed one throughout. And then I had a father who, uh, I'm told that my father always had his shoes handmade in England, but then partitioned happened. You couldn't carry on with that lifestyle of living. So, uh, but I think he loved, he loved looking at beautiful things. It wasn't a question of just being able to buy them. So we grew up going to sales and auctions and uh, to what were then called kabadi walas and now they're called, uh, they're called antique dealers, I think, <laughs> you know? So I think this has happened in every city. Um, so I, my first auction was there at the age of nine. I mean, there are so many instances, but because one grew up in this sort of potpourri of cultures and Lucknow is such an assimilative and syncretic city, that has always, that has always been the largest influence in my life for the rest of my life um, up to now. Thank you, Sunita. I should also mention that apart from all her writing skills and design skills and amazing planner, she's also a Visharad in music. Are you not, Sunita? And that's, uh, that's another part of Lucknow that fostered Everybody in Lucknow, that's the way we all grew up, that everybody had music lessons, classical music lessons in the afternoon. Some, of course, went on to sing, like my sister, and when people say, but she sings, and why don't you, how come you don't sing? I say, you know, so. <laughs> well, we're hearing you now. Uh, you know, going back to the cookbook, you've mentioned that uh, this is a book of everyday cooking and not an avdi cookbook, which a lot of people ask us, uh, you know, oh, wow, it's an avdi cookbook with traditional recipes. Definitely, it's inspired by that. Yes. But it's a book of everyday cooking. And uh, as we all know, our palettes are actually repositories of our memories. And we ca uh, carry cuisine. Our cu you know, cuisine is the intangible culture we carry with us wherever it is that life takes us, you know, now and in the past. So um, may I request you now to take us through a visual journey uh, into the Lucknow cookbook. Uh, these are just slides that if they come on. Um. <laughs> okay. So, this is in spite of practice. It didn't <laughs> quite happen. Uh, so these are, these, uh, this is, uh, these are biryanis and different types of kebabs and a lot of vegetarian food that uh, was, uh, that is in the book. And these are photographs that are from the book. Uh, these are different types of samosas. And here I want to mention to you that samosas were 
was something that were developed in Lucknow and and these are this is chicken and and Irish stews and because there was a huge influence of the British um, in in Lucknow and so Anglo Indian food also became something else and then of course we had all these Brahmin dishes of tehri and um, this chana which was done with kurchan ki paneer. These are very Lucknowy things. They're very simple to make, and I think they always turn out deliciously. So uh, then Lucknow is, these are all bharva, uh, what we call bharva, uh, you know, like bharva, karela, and uh, simle ki mirch. And then Lucknow has always had this wonderful tradition of, of thandai and of panna, which is made from green, uh, from green uh, uh, mangoes. And of course, uh, different juices like falsa. that. That's falsa and that's bail, ki, bail ka sharbat, which is very popular in Lucknow. Uh, then that, that's the only recipe I should speak about because uh, this, uh, this here is, this is not, this is jalebi pudding. And this is really an invention of my mother. And this is, um, uh, Aam Malai, Aam Malai. This, this was, you know, this recipe to me represents um, frugality and of having come through partition. Because if jalebis, like particularly in Masuri, uh, were bought for tea time, and then it's not, necessary, it's not necessary that everything would be consumed. So what was left the next day was never thrown away but was reused. And uh, then my mother, of course, devised this wonderful recipe with milk and eggs. The recipe is inside it. It's so simple to cook, and it is always delicious, because people don't know how this has come about. And speaking about frugality, once is sitting in my parents' home in Masuri and having tea, or having tea, and then, you know, in, in the hill stations, you use tea cozies, which I don't use in Delhi. And so I asked my mother, I said, you know that tea cozy and, and what you, the, the, to hold the, the hot handle of the teapot. I, I said, where have these come from? So she was kind of squirming a little bit in um, being slightly uncomfortable. So she said, oh, I can't remember. I said, no, but I remember very well. That happened, that used to be a kurta that I used to wear when I was age 15. <laughs> You know, <laughs> so, but that was the, the partition syndrome. You never threw away anything. You reused it. And that also got reflected with what they did with food in Lucknow. After all, even Shahi Tukra, you can only make if you have basa double roti. You cannot make it with fresh bread. It can only be made with stale bread. Um, then, of course, as I said, the British had been there and they had a huge influence. So high tea had become uh, very popular. And this is sort of various things that used to happen at high tea. And, and I really, I really uh, love the fact, I've always loved high teas anywhere. And I think that is because of having grown up in Lucknow. And I have to point out uh, the sandwich, which is again an assimilation uh, recipe of your mother's yes uh, this yes this is uh, this these, this is sandwiches that is made out of uh, korma. korma that again korma that is left over might have been made the day before and then the korma i mean the meat from the korma is chopped up and then you have onions green spring onions added and they really make and then of course you add whatever you need to add mustard etc they make the most delicious sandwiches. And I have to say that when we do non-vegetarian sandwiches, this is a signature sandwich in our homes. Uh, thank you, Sunita, for that uh, lovely journey, visual, uh, uh, and everyone will be hungry after this. But um, I'd also like to ask you about, uh, you know, the layers of syncretic assimilation in uh, Lucknow and also in Hyderabad, but more so in Lucknow. Uh, you know, you have the dahi ka shorba, 
And you have the kebab, which uh, we didn't talk about, uh, which really comes from Turkey. Mm. And, um, uh, you know, the huge uh, impact of the silk route on uh, cuisine and so many other things, which we are going to see later. But um, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about that. This is the dahi shorba. This is the next. Okay. What you see at the back is the Rumi Darwaza. It's a, the Rumi Darwaza is a very iconic landmark of Lucknow. And uh, it's called either the Rumi Darwaza or the Turkish Gate. And therefore, Lucknow, as I think Meeta mentioned, is always for, has, was always called the Istanbul of the East, as Lahore was called the Paris of the East. I mean, these have both been extremely sophisticated cities. And uh, you, in Lucknow, uh, uh, a very popular winter soup is garam dahinka shorba, which means warm yogurt soup. And many, many years later, 98, I think, was the first time that I went to uh, Istanbul. I've been back several times to that most beautiful country. And they had hot yogurt soup. I said, really? But that's such a Lucknow dish. They told me, no, <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a Turkish dish. So you see what happened. Not only did trade travel from down the Silk Route, but also art, ideas, cuisine. And then, of course, they got absorbed into. And since Lucknow, even more than the Mughal court, the, the food is really even more sophisticated. It's cooked in a different way, and you can never say that Avadi cuisine is Mughlai cuisine. I mean, there might be some similarities, but they're totally different. So this is how things got assimilated into cuisines. Mm. I think I've got. And then, as I spoke about Ganga Jamini uh, Tehzeeb, that in its material form used to happen in pandans with uh, you know gold washes. And this is called Gamna, uh, G Ganga Jamini work. It used to happen in brocades. This is, of course, a lota, mm -hmm. uh, all from Lucknow. And then there were several things that used to be made. I mean, bronze was made to, uh, bronze was used to make these absolutely beautiful uh, Fatima ke hath uh, for the Shias. And uh, then there was the tops of the staffs that were used for Muharram would be, I mean, that was a royal uh, staff head because it has uh, the Avadi crown on top. And because the British were here, uh, these all objects, incidentally, all sauce bo uh, bought in Lucknow. There used to be a lot of English, uh, not only just cutlery, but candlesticks as these are. And then there were all these wonderful gulab pashes and, um, and the, the itra dance and the itra dan, even though the glass is Mughal, because I've had it seen too, but the styling is, is British. It again is syncretic between, um, uh, between ang it's Anglo-Indian with Mughal glass bottles. And then, th interestingly, this, this uh, gulab pash has got Multani work from where my mother's ancestors first came and settled then in Quetta. And when my mother was always very charmed that when she arrived in Lucknow, there was something called Balochi Machi, which means, you know, fish from Balochistan. How did these names come? Obviously, there were, there were roots that were happening. And um, uh, if, if you look at a map of the Silk Route, you see that the Silk Route starts in Istanbul. And of course, one thing went up to Venice, because Venice wouldn't be Venice if it wasn't for all the Ottoman influences. But uh, then it came through Persia, through Afghanistan, uh, through uh, undivided India, which is now Pakistan, but was still very much India. And then one branch went to Quetta, and one came to Jaisalmer. I was so surprised to see this map of the Silk Route in a wonderful book called Art, Art Along the Silk Route by Jonathan Tucker. Mm -hmm. And I said, here, my mother's from Quetta and my father's from Jaisalmer. So I guess they were bound to get married. <laughs> so. Sunita, yeah. interject? Yeah. 
So um, I just wanted to bring something in. It was uh, uh, the poet Javed Akhtar, whom everyone knows as Bollywood's uh, great uh, scriptwriter and lyricist. He launched Sunita's uh, Lucknow cookbook in Bombay last year. And he defined, and he's a Lucknowi himself, so there were amongst many anecdotes, and it was a wonderful session. He described Ganga Jamani's Tehzeeb as the perfect synthesis of whatever beautiful that was imported and whatever wonderful that was indigenous. You know, and uh, that, you know, in, in his uh, typical manner, he can just put everything into a nutshell. Um, and we've just seen that in, in you know, Abjidat and daily objects, cooking. But now I'd like to take you uh, to how it's reflected in tangible cultural heritage through architecture. And then how has it uh, informed your choice of profession and your design sensibilities? So uh, several of the buildings, this is the Rumi Darwaza, which I... Uh, this is the Rumi Darwaza, which I show again. So one grew up surrounded by these buildings. They're not, they are like 15 minutes away. Uh, well, Bada Imam Bada is uh, very close to the Rumi Darwaza. Kesar Bagh, which used to be so beautiful. Uh, but you know, um, we as Indians, we lack, we lack a sense of, of an urgency to document and an urgency to conserve. So now many of what hap has happened inside Kesar Bagh, they all become shops, what used to be little, little, um, you know, dwellings for talukdars. They used to have their lands outside, but their small homes in Kesar Bagh. So, and then this is Kesar Bagh. This still exists, fortunately. Um, and this is the Bada Imam Bada. Uh, all these are 19th century uh, photographs that belong to the collection of Mr. Al Kazi. Then I only show one koti, but, and this one has already been destroyed. But um, uh, there were several kotis, and they're really quite beautiful. But um, I only show the one that is destroyed. The others one can still see. Then, of course, people forget that, that the French played an equally important role in, uh, in, building, in the building of, of uh, Lucknow, as did the British. And in fact, what Javed Saab also said, and we know, that the word firangi means, which we uh, use to, in Hindustani, uh, to call a foreigner, mm -hmm. firangi actually means a Frenchman. So when the British called themselves, we are firangis, they were actually saying we are French, you know. <laughs> so this is Constantia, built by Lord Claude Martin. And then speaking about syncretic culture and what has informed one and through all one's travels, I mean, uh, much as I enjoy traveling abroad, I enjoy traveling in this country, and I think these are habits inculcated by my father from a very, very early age. So I think we must have been 10 or 11, and you know, he took us to South India and to uh, Sri Lanka, and then he traveled all over. Uh, well, this is Champaner, it's a World Heritage Site. This is the Jami Masjid. The whole site is, as you know, is seventh century. But this was built in the 16th century. And here, in the Jami Masjid, you know, it's a many, it's a many pillared hall. And between, uh, between the columns, there are coffers. And the coffers are carved with a thousand lotuses. And these lotuses were made by Hindu craftsmen for a Muslim culture. So, I think there can be nothing more beautiful in the fact that this is how art and architecture was celebrated. And in many places, it still continues to have a similar uh, celebration because there was no distinction between who was doing who for what building. So these, this is, uh, so in fact, this, um, as Nita mentioned in, uh, September, I had I was a chief curator for the Times of India's uh, first design exhibition called the Festival of Art, Craft, uh, Architecture, and uh, Design Etymologies, and the acronym was Facade. And I use this as the lieth motif for what is the best 
of culture in our country. This wonderful synthesis of Hindu and Muslim, amongst many other. Uh, this is the Kutupinar, and again, it's uh, all the, the uh, there are several uh, indigenous crafts that have gone into whatever even might be the carved calligraphy and the motifs. And therefore, uh, Islamic architecture in India is totally different to Islamic architecture that might happen anywhere else in the world. This is, I showed the Humayun's tomb because one has also worked in this, in, for the gardens. And because this was, this style uh, was established in India and it is the precursor of how the Taj Mahal got built. So it's a very important building in that sense. So this is, of course, the Taj Mahal, and uh, and this is Fatehpur Sikri. I mean, Fatehpur Sikri with its wonderful stone, wonderful buildings that are Muslim, that are Christian, that are Hindu. So uh, some of these things need to be impressed, maybe now, and uh, and then you know we. I thought we should go to Bishnupur since Nita and I both traveled together to Bishnupur a couple of years ago. And you see this country is, everything doesn't, has not even been declared a World Heritage Site, such as this. And these are 450 year old terracotta temples. And they have yet to come on to, I mean, they're on a listing, but they have yet to be declared as World Heritage Site. This is, then I show another, another temple from this there. Is, is Exquisite, yes, yes. And I have to interject here to say that uh, traveling with Sunita is an immersive and fabulous experience, because, like traveling with a, you know, with a scholar. And um, she explained what, you know, how terracotta survived this long and, you know, the dating of it. Then, of course, you know, wherever there might be, uh, uh, yeah, the Jewish synagogue, as we all know, that the Jews came, the earliest Jews came here, uh, the earliest Christians came here. The, well, this is Bom Hezu, and uh, this happened in the 16th century. But the Syrian Christians who came in 40 AD, the earliest Christians. So we are, uh, uh, we are an amalgamation of so many influences. Uh, and then uh, why I show this temple in Khajurao is because uh, willy-nilly, I think I must have been to Khajurao 50, 60 times. Because this in 1975 was where I designed my first hotel. And I learned, so to speak, on the shop floor. This was called the Oberoi in Khajurao. Then, of course, uh, I went on in that same decade to design um, in uh, Bhuvaneshwar. Uh, where the great Lingaraj temple is, it's totally magnificent. Where Konarak temple is, um, with its amazing wheel of time, and then uh, and then the Mukteshwar temple by that extraordinary Thoran. And why I show these is because uh, I finished this I think in 1982. I designed the trident Oberoi there without taking something directly from uh, from. Uh, you know, everything that one saw, I certainly use those craft traditions like the bronze bell and uh, all the you know, all the uh, sandstone and granite work that was done. And this flooring, the central flooring, is, is actually uh, a graphic plan of the ceiling in Mukteshwar temple. And, uh, and then when you go further through this hotel, um, where am I? Uh, uh, this, the, 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 the stairwell, the stairwell ceiling becomes the way, it's the same plan as in the Mukteshwar temple. Now I have to tell you that to me as a designer, I'm known to be research-based, which I am, 
to me it doesn't matter if other people don't get it as long as i have got it you know uh, so why i am doing why i am doing because for i am a firm believer that you know in homes you can do many other things i am also a firm believer that when you do uh, public buildings of which i have had the good fortune and the honor of doing several important ones it must be reflective of that cultural milieu it must be reflected of that place of that country so uh then i've done things like forts it was in naila fort for mr p r s oberoi which is his private retreat in jaipur and uh sorry i i couldn't find the photograph without me so just ignore that but this is uh, how i set about things the same exact this is in in agra fort uh in uh, in well agra fort in agra and i had exactly the same thing made um, carved in marble and all this pietra dura work that i had done in that fort uh, you just see small portions of it here but there are full floorings that i've got done so i kind of worked towards bringing back and perhaps i was the first um a designer who did that of bringing back this amazing craft tradition of pietra dura of which you see uh, i mean agra is full of but bringing it um uh, bringing back the importance of it as an architectural element and not for you know having little boxes or chess tables or table tops and things so um then during the same that same decade of uh, the late 70s i was working in egypt that's the mina house and that used to be a old hunting lodge of king farooq of course overlooking the great pyramids of cheops and here i did i designed for the obro as their first casino this is the only place where i used something that was from india because i thought i had these wonderful portraits done of the baby uh, of the bbs and the begums of india and all from orientalist paintings um uh, well that is all uh, the hotel on gomri street and the greenery restaurant again uh, for cairo i used i studied and used 14th century islamic architecture and interiors uh so that that this restaurant which is their big brasserie is reflective of that uh then i designed three boats on the nile and they were huge 60 cabin cruisers with uh, with um, with uh, state rooms and things and a bar and a restaurant and pool swimming pools and things so you can but this is the last boat that i designed with this was actually in the 90s and uh, on for i had done two earlier boats so obroy shahriar and obroy sherzad this obroy fillet cruiser was the first boat that i worked on with the swedish company to also what was the form of the boat apart from just doing the interiors so uh, and since it's a, what they call a stern wheeler and it was 19th century i chose to make it go along the way of what used to be happen in 19th century where if you wanted to have a classical education you uh, you know a young man of course of means also had to travel to uh, to greece and to italy and to egypt so it's in that turn of the century of the previous century style um these are just uh, you know uh, elevations that i had done in my time we hand drew everything now of course everything is is on computer and on autocad so i just said i should show a couple of these things that we had a different way of working i mean i had a um, architectural and design studio because my daughter's company is also part of k2 india the our company that is called k2 india and they work totally differently um uh, so this this is also lost art uh of that you did everything that was handmade and uh, or hand drawn rather 
They've become collector pieces now. You know yes. that they keep coming so up on from that structure. drawing. Yes, uh, elevation. This is the finished staircase with its huge orientalist painting, and this is the lobby lounge of that boat, and. This is in Aswan, Upper Egypt. This is all pharaonic, so it required another type of research. This is um, in El Arish, which is on the north coast of the Mediterranean. This is all Bedouin, so everything there is reflective of that area. And this is, um, this is the brasserie in El Arish. And the fronds of the palm that one sees are all made out of baladi glass, which in Egypt is a very strong craft tradition from the 8th century. Yeah. This is so, just a brief overview. Yeah. Thank you, Sunita. Your brief is <laughs> fairly <laughs> exhaustive, I think, for us. Uh, but I'd now like to bring you back to the city where some of your most prestigious commissions have happened, New Delhi. You worked on the buildings of the three British architects who actually created New Delhi. And um, you're considered now the foremost expert on uh, Sir Ed Edwin Lachian's um, in India, having restored his most famous work, the Rashtrapati Bhavan. Can you share your own views on Lachian's, who's sometimes con considered controversial, you know, because of the imperialism and uh, uh, colon uh, you know, colonialist architecture? Um, and your experience working on one of his most fam famous buildings. And as well, can you lead us visually through some of your key restoration projects and design commissions in New Delhi? Well, um, I was, I felt very honored when I was first asked to work in Rashtrapati Bhavan, uh, just for a few state rooms in 1982, which were going to be used by Queen Elizabeth. Uh, and where the Commonwealth Conference was going to take place in Hyderabad House. Now, Hyderabad House is used uh, by the prime ministers. It is their official uh, venue for entertaining. So uh, this, I'm sure all of you know, is uh, in India Gate. This is India Gate. And that's used to be called Kingsway, now it's called Rajpat. Mm. And then there's sort of South Block, North Block, and there's Rashtrapati Bhavan over there. And you uh, restored all three. Okay. Uh, well, portions of, uh, portions of South Block more than North Block, because the Prime Minister's office had completely restored in 1985. And I'm happy to say that through nine Prime Ministers, it has not changed. And the reason why that was, because the then Prime Minister, Mr. Gandhi, told me, he said, please do not design it for me, but design it for the Prime Minister of India. So it was, and I remember that was one brief, and the second brief that he said is, I want my chair to be the same height as my visitor's chairs. So you know, these are very indicative of character and of what one believes. In any case, so I've worked on it. I worked on Rashtrapati Bhavan at different times, 82, as I mentioned. Then, uh, but my serious and most immersive restoration was between 85 and 89. And uh, for Hyderabad House, it was 89 and 90. So I'll just show a couple of. Uh, so this, of course, is that famous um, painting by Karl Lobert where he's shown all the different things that Lachians had done. Um, where you see Rashtrapati Bhavan, you see Castle Drogo and everybody. Uh, you see the unbuilt in the center, the unbuilt Liverpool Cathedral. So, and you have the, this is the dome of Rashtrapati Bhavan. So this is a very famous painting. It's a very beautiful painting. A lot of the buildings, not a lot, but a few of the buildings are also in uh, are part form part of this composition. Uh, this is Rashtrapati Bhavan, and it's uh, it's dome. Now, what Lachians did was that even though when he first arrived and he was first commissioned, uh, the 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 Delhi committee, as they were called, they went looking for 
uh, they went looking for uh, things that that could be that you know just to see what was uh, what architecture in india was all about and he made to what uh, to what uh, neeta was referring to he made two very yeah two very disparaging remarks one about hindu architecture uh, saying that all these terrifying shapes that were carved and things and then mohammedan architecture take a square cut it into an octagon and then place you know so he had all of that now a lot of uh, many many uh, architectural or people who are writing on new delhi tend to take that as as that that was but that was just the beginning he hadn't begun uh, designing rashtrapati bhavan or hyderabad house uh, north and so south block are uh, designed by sir herbert baker his collaborator as also his parliament house and then the third major architect who worked there was sir robert or russell who made connaught place which was then in the 1930s considered the most important uh, uh, the best designed uh, shopping center in the world he also designed the murti house it was called the murti house after independence but before that it it was used to be the house of the residence of the commander in chief so having said that when he actually started to design it at right at the beginning let me say that there are many architectural historians me included not as an architectural historian but what working on this building revealed to me it is called a double magnificence because even though the form of the building is um, is neoclassical um, the form but he took an integrally sort of absorbed within his plan of rashtrapati bhavan uh, elements that are absolutely indian and for example is the dome that you all can see and which i don't seem to be able to point out but you can see the dome over there so that is taken from sanchi and uh, that's the dome that's the sanchi dome uh, then in that i'll go back and in that uh, um, then all these chhajjas which are actually 5 feet deep he took from rajput architecture and the chhatris he took again from hindu and and uh, rajput architecture so it became this huge amalgam of many things that he used uh, uh and then to the five orders of architecture on which all of western architecture has is based he devised and created the sixth order called the delhi order which had which is unique which had temple bells because he saw that this side photograph is bhoj of the 10th century incomplete temple of bhojpur in madhya pradesh so he amalgamated all this but of course uh, rashtrapati bhavan was completed in 1931 <laughs> and partition happened in 1947 and actually uh, i was telling neeta that part of the the architectural history of that period is that in in the darbar of 1911 when it was announced that the capital the king announced it that the capital would move from calcutta to delhi nobody was happy about it the people in calcutta didn't want now their capital city to be relegated to the position of of, of being a provincial city and the hindus didn't like it because why should now the capital move to what had already been uh, you know the capital of many muslim dynasties but everybody agreed on one thing and that was that the hindu population that whoever established their capital in new delhi it presaged the collapse of that dynasty and sure enough the british didn't last you know the 1931 was the official opening and of course you know their story uh, i can't carry on with lachins i'll tell you why because this these are lectures <laughs> fully that i've given all over you know a harvard and also if anybody wants to ask me a question later but this is um, this is a subject that i've i 
Temple. I've had the honor of working on, on these very iconic buildings, and it's a subject that is dear to my heart, and one can speak about it extensively. Sun S Sunita, I'd like to point out that Sunita is an autodidact, exactly like Lachian's. And she yeah. says it's too big a compliment, but. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where's Lachian's, where's For self-taught. And now this is again Rashtrapati Bhavan. And if you see the fan light of these doors that lead to the Mughal gardens, where did Latians take them from? He took them from these jalis, which are presently in the Red Fort. Now, another example is that these are elephants. As these are, again, in Rashtrapati Bhavan. These are on the gates. Where did he take them from? He took them from the Red Fort. So, uh, the, but the sad, and then he used many Indian motifs, like, you know, the significance of the snake in these fountains. This is in the North Court. Uh, he used, uh, he, this is the Mughal Gardens. He used these, uh, he used the lotus form for these fountains. And of course, uh, this is the Jaipur column, where at the bottom, it is inscribed in stone, in thought, faith, in word, wisdom in deed, courage, in life, service, so may India be great. I mean, he, he the sad thing was that Lachins has created something magnificent uh, for, for the capital city, city of Delhi, but he never acknowledged his Indian sources. That was the imperialistic, uh, you know, mindset. It wasn't what he created. What he's created, I've just taken you very briefly through how he integrated what was truly Indian into magnificence based on a Renaissance plan. Then uh, this, these are 1941 photographs of the South drawing room. This is where, uh, you know, whoever is the visiting head of state who is staying will stay um, or is, no, uh, not will stay. He will, that is where whoever has to visit the visiting head of state will come and call on him in this room. And this is what I'd done with it in 1986, in time for Mr. Gorbachev's visit. And uh, this is the North drawing room. And this is when, where the, where, uh, uh, whoever has to call on, on uh, the president will come there. This is a very beautiful room. And even for the flooring over here, uh, Lachians took the mandala, the circle within a square. And this is the banquet hall over here. It remains the same. And uh, unfortunately, this has all been removed. This was from the Lahore Armory of 1878. It's I'm not going to take any names and get into trouble. But uh, who the president was, who removed it, and whatever it is, because I'm a firm believer that these buildings actually belong to the nation. They cannot be, they should be a whole group of people who should sit, deliberate, and then it should be decided how you can move forward with them. And I think that even the president is, of course, honorable and the first citizen of the country. But at the end of the day, that building is not his. It's for his to live in whilst he's the president. But these buildings only belong to the nation and need to be preserved accordingly. And incidentally, it took me 20 years, and I supposedly knew who everybody was because they were kind of my clients, uh, even though this was, um, the, this is, I've only done honorary work on these. I've, I chose to, I never charged a rupee. I chose to do it as my contribution to my own country. And what could I give? My time and my skill. So um, uh, this is Hyderabad House, which was completely restored. Uh, they closed it for a year, and that was the first time they did it, and the only time it was closed. And it's a very, very beautiful building. and. Uh, and several rooms inside. I mean, the whole from top to bottom was was done, and including I laid out these courtyards in the style of Lachians because for some reason 
uh, there was no paving, there was nothing. So, uh, and uh, uh, this is, uh, I worked with Charles Courier. Uh, to, he was the architect for the British Council building, which is uh, the largest out of the 80 offices. I did the interiors. Uh, and I've done several residences for embassies. This is the German ambassador's residence, and I've done the Australians, and for Edmund Hillary. So the list goes on. And uh, and then I've done I've done um, bungalows in the Lachins bungalow zone. Uh, for instance, uh, I've some I've restored, some I've designed. Uh, the restoration work was. Uh, for the two bungalows at uh, uh, the Indra Gandhi Memorial Museum. So those two bungalows designed by Sir Robert Tor Russell were completely uh, restored. Uh, the bungalows of the official residence of uh, the Prime Minister bungalows that I have completely restored. Here I'm not concerned about really the design and the decoration, but so that these bungalows get the lease of life of another 50, 60, 70 years. But in that area, I have also designed, now this is where you know, conservation work, what you were asking me earlier, what is the difference between conservation and, and uh, design work? When you're working on, <coughs> excuse me, on architectural conservation, then you look at all the original drawings and what was the original intent of the architect. And you hope that when you finished your conservation, that in two years time, nobody will even remember that there was an intervention by a designer or an architectural restorer. To my mind, that is proper conservation work. But when you are designing a building or when you're designing an interior or doing the interior architecture of a building, such as for this one, then there are absolutely new concepts you're creating. And <clears throat> I like to work a lot with, uh, with, uh, with, within, this is a very contemporary building. It's in the midst of the Lachian's bungalow zone. And I like to work a lot with uh, craftsmen. So these have been done um, by a very renowned craftsman from, um, from Orissa, who's the only craftsman ever to have received, or so far to have received, a Padma Vibhushan. And uh, these are miniaturized forms of these little temples in that, uh, in that reflecting pool. Uh, miniaturized forms of uh, the main temple, which is in the sacred tank of the great Lingaraj temple. I mean, that's the way I like to work. So uh, whether somebody says it's just, uh, you know, well, these are little temples, but I have to know in my mind from where it's coming, how it's coming, what is the proportion of it. So, because I enjoy that journey. Uh, and this is the same house, contemporary, but has lots of uh, uh, other, uh, for instance, has something which is integral to me. And this is that, these, this is a Ganga Jamini ceiling. So even though it's a very contemporary house, major artwork, Tayyab and everybody else, uh, but this, uh, this actually quietens down the, uh, the kind of the, the contemporary nature or the modern nature of this house. And what you really can't make out here, but this is a 500, no, 400 year old Mughal carpet. And so you have a very contemporary um, setting. Uh, the architecture and everything else that goes into it, and these lights which are from Vinini, the best manufacturers of decorative lights in the world, Italian, and yet there's a rootedness, there's an Indianness, so you bring it in a contemporary way, and that's the way I like to work. Uh, uh, that's a quote which you can read, and I think that's where we'll finish this yeah. session. This, this part of the... Uh, you know, I'd like to uh, bring in a, a renowned architect whom you've worked with, the late Charles Correa, who said once that Sunita can be 10 designers rolled into one. I'd like you to, you know, explain to us what he meant by that. 
Firstly, I have to say that Charles was a friend of mine. Okay, so <laughs> apart from that, I think what he meant is that I I worked uh, with um, a lot of different styles simultaneously. Like if I was doing, um, if I was working on uh, Renaissance buildings like in New Delhi, uh, designed by Edwardian architects like. Uh, like, uh, you know, like Lachians and Baker. At the same time, I could be doing Vicky Oberoi's fort, which was all Rajput. I could be doing projects in uh, in Egypt, which were either Islamic or which were, uh, you know, which were pharaonic or required different types of work. And this, um, I think this is best illustrated, this point, and therefore I took out this slide. Uh, this is... Uh, this is the this is a building that I designed uh, with a local uh, with an architect, but I did it right from scratch. And this is the Parliament building, and uh, in Thimphu, Bhutan. And this was in the late eighties. So, uh, in a sense, then I worked with His Majesty, the present King's father, and uh, and these are so it was highly researched uh, when research was very difficult at that time because there wasn't, I'm talking about the late 80s, there wasn't a book uh, that could be, uh, that one could read on Bhutanese art, architecture. There was, oh my God, that's the nth time. That uh, there was, uh, uh, there was a book by G.N. Mehra, uh, which belonged to the, a former ambassador of, uh, to Bhutan, Salman uh, Heather, and I borrowed it, I photocopied it, and he said, you can't disappear with it, Sunita. I said, no, I'm just photocopying it, returned it, and uh, and then I heard that there was a exhibition taking place at, uh, I think it was at um, the Hayward Gallery in, in London uh, on Buddhism, and I went dashing for the weekend, um, just to have a look at that exhibition, and they covered every single country excepting Bhutan. So, uh, you know, so there was, it was difficult, but once I was assigned to do uh, this uh, parliament building, then His Majesty and his sister, who was then the finance minister, they gave me, they gave me every facility. For instance, they appointed a, a, a living, Encyclop uh, encyclopedic, with an encyclopedic mind uh, guide for me, uh, who was also a lama, Dasho Khandu, and he traveled the length and breadth of Bhutan, and I could go into every zong, zong meaning a monastery, uh, even that was close to the public. So it was very hands-on research. It was looking at things. It was looking at studying motifs. Um, so this is the result, this is the ceremonial entrance, this is the throne room, and here I have to point out that this, this pointer go over here. You, no, wait, any case, you can see the, uh, you can see the, the, the windows that are there, and uh, I think now it's become very trendy to do it like this. I was the person who devised that these exterior windows you could use inside and in this particular hall, uh, they are used for where the from where the simultaneous uh, translation takes place. So, you know, I'm glad I've become part of the fabric of, of Bhutan uh, in that sense. I mean, this is a close-up of these windows that I, I brought in, had painted, but all absolutely according to tradition. And for the, even for doing this, reflect uh, the ceiling, which is... Uh, above, I wanted to use the mandala, but then they, then they gave me another lama who is the director of the national library, with whom I worked because every stroke is important. So I, as an outsider with little knowledge, did not wish to do the incorrect thing. So all that happened. This is a close-up because, as they say, that you know, uh, a mandala above bestows blessings on those below. So I wanted to use that. 
And then in uh, then I came back to Bhutan in uh, 2010. That was both my daughter Kohelika and I, who's an architect, as I mentioned earlier. And um, this was because the SARC summit was going to happen there for the first time. So it seemed like full circle uh, to be doing this. And this, uh, the prime minister's office was converted into this lounge for heads of state. And it seemed full circle coming um, about SARC. And Bhutan actually started in, um, in Bangalore. And I thought I should share it with you because in 1986, uh, the SARC summit took place in Bangalore at the Vidhan Sauda. And I was asked by government then uh, to work on the restoration, design, decoration, and setting up the retreat for heads of state, which is Kaban House, which is, as you know, 50 kilometers from here. So I went there with the chief of protocol, who was Salman Heather then, and I went there and I was absolutely appalled because a Kaban House, as you all know, is this beautiful house uh, in, it's not in Kaban Park, which is local here. I mean, you know Kaban House. So it's on this monolithic, granite, beautiful trees, and this white house, or whitish then, I made it absolutely pure white, uh, but on a high plinth, but with everything broken inside. I mean, the balusters, which were out of clay, were broken. We went inside these very handsome doors, and the doors, which should have had five brass hinges, were hanging on two hinges. Somebody had just stolen the brass. Every single fireplace was broken. The red oxide floors had, uh, you know, khaddas. I mean, they were like potholed. And so I, I said, uh, when I came back, I then told, um, there was a very, there was um, the, the chief um, secretary at the PMO. Uh, with the, she had a very beatific smile always. And I told her, I said, you know, I, I'm so sorry, but I don't think I'll be able to uh, complete this in three months. I mean, you can't, this date for SAC is set. Now they expect me to do the whole thing. In any case, that's what I did. I mean, the persuasions are something else. Again, of course, it was one of my honorary projects. Again, my, uh, my contribution to my own country. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, you know what? So, Cabin House was completed. Everything was restored, uh, and uh, the furniture was all English. All the artwork that I used for was from around only South India, whether it was uh, maps of South India, or whether there were lithographs of South India, or whether we, all the artwork was from here. And of course, you know, before they were going to come, the prime ministers or the heads of state and only the seven, seven heads of state and seven uh, of their foreign ministers. Um, you know, uh, I made it, I guess I have some talents, and one of the talents is to make it appear as if the house has always been like that, rather than it had been, you know. So the in silver bonbon dishes, chocolates were there, and you know, the newspapers and magazines were in their old, uh, things, the whatnots had different things. So it looked as if the house had always been slumbering there. So apparently, now this I get from the then um, uh, chief of protocol. He said that the President Jayavardhane turned around and asked our, uh, asked PM, he said, how beautifully you keep your old houses. <laughs> so, you know, and he said PM had a slight smirk on his face because he's, he knew that you had just left at 4 a.m. the night before. Because, you know, security throws you out. You can't do anything more. In any case, I had. And then it was at that meeting in Kaban House, apparently that uh, the Bhutanese foreign uh, minister, a uh, very canny man who then had the, uh, I think his name was Dago, Dago Shering. And uh, he asked who had done this house. Um, and you know, and then 
it was PM who said that actually it's a designer we have in Delhi. And then they wrote to me, and then it went on from some undersecretary. It wasn't that the foreign, sec uh, the foreign minister wrote to me. It was from some undersecretary, and because Bhutan interested me, I kept replying back and forth to everything that came, and one day I was commissioned. So that is the story of how Bhutan began in Bangalore. I thought it would interest you, you know. So, okay. So this is another view of the same room, and this is this. This is now with K4, and why I've shown this picture is because there's one with K4. This is 2010. That's my daughter Kohelika, who's the architect, and uh, and this is with the prime minister. So when I first began parliament, the parliament building, I began with Bhutan being a monarchy. And when I worked on it in 2010, uh, it had become a democracy. Uh, I love, we love this quote. Yeah. The world is a book, and those who do not travel read only a page. And um, Nita found this wonderful quote and uh, because she was going to question me about traveling. I yeah, think. I've said that she's been an intrepid traveler since she was a childhood and to travel with her, whoever has that privilege is such an immersive experience. I've spoken about that. Uh, but travel is a great passion of yours. And um, uh, you know, you've know, you traveled all over the world within and outside the country. How has this informed uh, you know, your design aesthetic and also your you know, life philosophy, in a way. Um, there's something I wrote when I was 16, and which I still have. It's, I travel not to reach. Uh, destinations are not my destiny. I travel but for travel's sake. And I think that excitement of traveling, of other places being revealed, other cultures being uh, revealed, other points of view being revealed, because the world is a wonderful place. And I think it's made more wonderful because of the diversities that we have and these interchanges that we can have. So, uh, you know, my last uh, major travel was actually um, in outside Bangalore. This is a trip that one did in March, which is to the southern, uh, to a southern, to the southern Hoysala temples. You know. Forgive me, but that 16 syllabic name, I was trying to remember just <laughs> coming, but I just couldn't recollect it. So this was a group, and this was March. And similarly, one has done Bimbetka. Everything reveals something else. Uh, these wonderful 30,000-year-old paintings. I am not even going to try in the Brihadeshwara temple. There's something else happening there. I mean, this, this is such an amazing country. Uh, and then th there's the descent of the Ganga and what happens when in Mahabalipuram and what happens when we worked, a whole group of us worked on this memorial to Sri Gandhi uh, after his assassination or where he was assassinated. I mean, these are things that come back because of travels, because every memory is, memory is mnemonic. And I think for everybody, but I think particularly for designers and architects, um, there is a visual library that you create unconsciously in, within your own mind as you keep traveling, whether it's here or traveling anywhere else abroad. Uh, you know, these, all, these, are, these are just recent trips. I mean, of course, I've been to Ajanta Elora at least six or seven times, but this was what was done by, uh, with my, this is Padma Pani. This was what I did last year only with my granddaughter. So I took my children, tra like my father took us traveling, I took my children traveling, and now my daughter takes her children traveling. So, uh, and this is of course that most amazing Kailashna temple, yet to become a World Heritage Site, is the largest granite monolithic structure where it was, you know, as you all know, it was carved from on top. So you can imagine the skill of the, not only just architecture, but of engineers. Of You had to know, have a great knowledge of dance, of music, of your own mythologies to be able to create something like this. Because there is 
it's completely monolithic from top to bottom. And I always feel we should really start a movement and have our own heritage sites listing. You know, why w wait for them in, uh, to decide what can be a world heritage site in India and not. Um, and uh, well, been part of civil society, Banaras I've worked a lot in, and which is a beautiful city. And then I only just touch upon maybe not even just what one has done in the last 12 months. These most amazing trips to Armenia, to Georgia, I don't know what they put in, to Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, this, is, uh, th this is actually uh, these stalactites and stalagmites. There's, there's, uh, there's a very, uh, there's a chandelier that I use, which is called Hollywood. And when you see this, it's so reminiscent. After all, you know, those are designers that are sitting in Europe. They too are being informed by something that they have seen. And so then come back in, coming back to the Hoysala temples, I mean, the magnificence of them, because here uh, the high plinth is really used as a storyboard. I mean, this is the beauty of, of uh, what we do. Um, and then this was again this March, uh, which is really in your back, backyard, seeing Tipu Sultan's summer palace, which I saw again after 25 years. The sophistication of that coloring, that ultra refinement. I mean, one was struck anew by what this country is really all, ab all about. And, uh, So this is what happens, and this is again the backdrop of this is uh, this is from Tipu Sultan, from the Summer Palace. Yeah, and I've put it there um, to link Sunita's design sensibility is so rooted in the syncretism of the land and a very informed sensibility, but yet it is uh, uh, imbued with the contemporary. You know, there's a, like she's shown in the Latin's bungalows, um, you know, the rootedness of the land is all there, and the contemporary looks absolutely <coughs> natural with it. And um, so, Sunita, as we near the end of our conversation, may I ask you to showcase some of your recent design works and, uh, you know, exhibition spaces, as well as some of the larger contemporary homes. Display your, yeah. Uh, this is a home we recently completed in last year, or no, couple of years ago in Baroda. It's contemporary, the way we like to work, but it is somehow rooted in this country. It might be uh, in different ways that you see what is happening. It might be the way you use wood, uh, the way you use uh, this is these are very this is these are very famous chandeliers called Hollywood, mm -hmm. and if I showed I showed you a slide of the stalactites, it just goes to show that these Italian designers must also have been inspired from some similar visual. Um, this is the same home in Baroda, and if you remember the colors of uh, Tipu Sultan's palace which I visited in March. And this is what we designed in the February of this year. And therefore, I think that, that uh, you know, our memories are racial. There are things that we remember. And when they come out, how they come out is another matter altogether. And so, this is the Tipu Sultan's coloring. Uh, this is another view of the February. This is India Design 2000 and and 19. And uh, I just want to show very quickly and run through this, and I think that's the last thing we are doing, right? Yeah. Uh, is, uh, yeah. is that in the same space, year after year, and here I must say, uh, though I head my firm, but it is primarily 
कोहिने का कोली दी आर्किटेक्ट हु इज क्रिएटिंग अ टोटली डिफरेंट एक्सपीरियंस इन द सेम स्पेस दिस इज 2000 व्हाट वाज डन इन 2014 um also 2014 just details of it this was done in 15 2015 same space again and these are details from it uh every year we present uh, at india design we present a new collection of furniture because as neeta i think mentioned we've been furniture manufacturers for the last 48 years i mean i have um and then uh, this was 17 i think yes 17 and again 17 and this is 18 this is again 2018 the same spaces are being used to create a totally different structure from within the interior architecture the new furniture the new lights etc and uh, and this was what we had done for india design in 2013 because this was a different space and within 800 square feet uh, kohelika who is the ceo of my company um, in 800 square feet she showcased what you how you can create a luxury apartment uh, without uh, showing the bathroom and the kitchen so these are just some uh, shots of that and this is the bathroom with the little i mean the bedroom with the study etc and then uh yeah she's a writer as well and there's several books i think in the pipeline these are some of the ones that she, she, she's done already uh i've done essays within these books um and i have championed that writing of history and this is this is the most recent cover that came out i think last month and some others that have come out uh through the years and uh and this is the most recent book that i'm working on which uh kala uh which and this has to be completed and handed over by november 30th so if ravi says you know i was trying to find you here there and everywhere this is what happens so i'm working I, on it tomorrow as well yes <laughs> while on holiday yeah. <laughs> yeah uh thank you so much sunita and i'd like to open the forum for questions from the audience ravi we have time sir 5 10 minutes yeah. thank you one question what's your view on the central vista project <laughs> <laughs> thank you ravi thank you because i was forbidden to ask that i think about 10 of them want to ask the same question okay you know uh i know what everybody else knows uh is what has been appearing in the newspapers now only when uh, i mean if it's now they put up all the i think there were six architects who were asked and so they put uh, up their plans on the internet and out of which it uh, seems that the least offensive was the one who won the yeah who won the competition uh I don't know actually what it is because they are not revealing uh, any uh, they're not revealing any uh, any said um, you know the way they're going to move forward after all what was uh, did they do a heritage impact study etc and um, what can i say i mean these are things that there are things that need to be done and not uh, you can't have the have the urban affairs minister saying but we are sure that there will no there will be no trees I, will be cut yeah no, so. i'd like to um, uh, you know bring to attention that it's uh, sir edwin lachian's 150th birth anniversary year and sunita was there for the celebrations in london and the trust is also very worried about that because a lot of the 
Yeah, there's going to be changes. Yeah. But we have to just wait and watch. And, and I'm sure, uh, you know, the best sense will prevail. So. Time and I'm still salivating from some of the <laughs> early part of the presentation. Uh, you didn't talk about, um, I think it's Lucknowese, but correct me if I'm wrong, the Galauti kebab. Uh, the Galauti <laughs> kebab. Uh, is it from Lucknow and it, does it have a history? Is it like Turkish or, you know, what, what's it? Gilawat ke kebab. I know. Galauti is only okay, I'm Punjabis. <laughs> we all used to say that. She corrected us. Yeah. We, Huh, okay. Yeah. No, even Gilawat ke kebab are from Lucknow. So, and Kakori is a small village actually, uh, which is fairly close to, uh, close to Lucknow. And the story goes, and I think it's true because so many people tell the same thing, that uh, you know the the Nawab of Kakori, he lost all his teeth, and so. <laughs> Uh, you know, they had to kind of grind it and grind it and grind it. Really, it's so smooth to that smoothness. And of course, the original one had 33 spices in it. And um, even now, I mean, if you have kakori kebab in Lucknow, it's totally delicious. And um, so there are so actually the stories of Lucknow's food because... Um, you know, they, would, they could do grains of rice where one, one part would be left of each grain would be left white and the other would be colored by pomegranate. You know, so it had reached that extreme of refinement mm -hmm. that what, what they could create. Sure. And, uh, and there was a passion about food, how it was served, uh, the, all the rituals around even the pan, pandan, I mean, if you ever came to somebody's house, the first thing that would be done is, you know, how uh, there was pan would be served and then gulab pash. And, they, uh, and it wasn't just cooks, so they had the masalchi and um, the, rakabdars, the rakabdars, and each would do a different thing, and then there would be competitions, right, between the naba there nawabs. Would be that, for, and no highborn woman ever made any form of roti. Oh, yeah, that. I know. Mr. And Akhtar. Uh, yes, Javed Akhtar, as he told us, he said, ke, I mean, at a, he was telling us this incident about being at uh, a relative's house. Yeah. And he said, you know, the, the older woman told the younger woman, Suna, suna hai razia ke tum roti bhi banati ho. That's the biggest <laughs> insult. That means you weren't so high born. You could cook other things, but not roti. They were made by roti walas. So. And again, we've not because this was a kind of life and times, right, of uh, Sunita Kohli, and we took it. But um, uh, language, which is also intangible culture, and Urdu, um, which the home of Urdu is um, Lucknow. You know, would you like to talk a little bit about that? You know, I don't know why an impression is being created that Urdu is. Uh, is a language that came from outside. No, Urdu is based on Khadi Boli, which is the language of, of, uh, of you know, the hinterlands in, in Awadh. And then when it got with Islamic rulers, then when it got, uh, you know, when Persian came into it and all that, Urdu was really the camp followers, or Hin Hindustani was the camp followers language. So it, it is very much an indigenous language and a language that has come from the soil. I think uh, Javed said, Hindavi uh, Zubane Urdue Mahala, Mahala being the cantonment. And he said everything got dropped and then it remained Urdu. And that if we say that uh, because English is written in the same script as Latin, that's Latin, or French is also English, so it's the same thing. It's actually Khadi Boli, written in a different script. That's the, so it's very indigenous to the subcontinent. It's not a foreign import. So that's, again, an intangible culture that, you know, is. It needs to be preserved, preserved. that absolutely exquisite language. 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sunita and Neeta. I think that was a fascinating journey. And since Javed Saab was mentioned so many times, I just close with one little thing that happened here. So when Shabana Azmi was here about two, three months ago, I find Jenny has already <laughs> left. After the event, you know, we hadn't figured out where to take Shabana after the event. And she said, both of you can work a little bit on your tezib. Now, I understand <laughs> what she was referring to. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming this evening. And uh, look forward to having you at more BIC events. Thank you. A last thing on that, <laughs> a last thing on that note, uh, which is about, so I mean, Shabana I've known for many, many years. So uh, I said, ke, so somebody asked Javed at that same book launch of uh, my mother's and mine in Bombay, so what is the difference between a Lucknowi biryani and a Hyderabadi biryani? So he says, Kyu? Ab Lucknowi biryani ko ab do din basa chhod dije. Wo Hyderabadi biryani ban gayi. <laughs> so I told Javed, you are very fortunate that Shabana is not here because Shabana <laughs> just sent me a message. She'd got tied up with the, with the shoot that she was doing. So I said, Nito, wo aapki khabar leti. Thank you so much. Thank you.